Uh, this lecture is about separation of variables. We have, you've probably seen, we have talked about several times about how the total wave function, now a function of electron coordinates and atomic coordinates is equal to a product of an electronic wave function, a vibrational wave function, a rotational wave function, and a translational wave function. The electronic wave function has to do with the, the is the wave function of the electrons. And then vibration, rotation, translate vibration and rotation have to do with the positions of the atoms themselves, working in a potential, which is derived from that electronic wave function, translational particle in a box that we've looked at previously. These are approximations that we're going to go through in order to do to break this uh, wave function up into these four pieces. So first off, My total Hamiltonian is going to be equal to some, give me several terms. First off, I've got um, m nuclei. And so we're going to take minus h bar squared over 2 times the mass of each nuclei times a del squared for the nuclei. <clears throat> That's the nuclear kinetic energy. For all of the electrons, summing over all the electrons, we're going to have a couple of terms. One is the electron kinetic energy and then electron nuclear attraction. So the first term is an electron kinetic energy term. And the second one, now notice, we have not only inside of the sum for electrons, we also have a sum for all nuclei of the nuclear electron attraction. We're going to have for all of the electrons for you know, j less than k, so we're not double counting, e squared over rjk. So what is that? That is going to be our electron-electron repulsion, which we've handled previously in looking at atoms and molecules. And then finally, the nuclear-nuclear repulsion. So this is, uh, we've kind of put all of this together before. And we're going to break this up in an interesting way. <clears throat> we're going to put this into an electronic form and a kinetic energy term. And T is going to be my nuclear kinetic energy term. The HE is the electronic Hamiltonian. It comprises all of the other terms. So the nuclear kinetic energy term, that first term that we had, is the only one we're pulling out. Okay. So the, all of the other terms are in the electronic Hamiltonian. I want to talk about, so the major approximation that we're going to make is called the born oppenheimer approximation, which is you know, comes from you know, uh, born and Oppenheimer, of course. Uh, <clears throat> so the full electronic wave function can be expanded into a set of electronic wave functions. And notice what we've done with this is we're saying the full electronic wave function is a function of R of electronic coordinates. So and our nuclear coordinates. And now we're using a different notation for the psi i. The R line capital R means that we're going to be, uh, that, that our electronic wave function psi i is going to be a function of the electronic coordinates, but it's going to be calculated at fixed nuclear position. So at fixed nuclear position, here is my electronic wave function. Now I changed that a little bit. Now is my new set wave function. So my result is my total wave function is then a, going to be expanded into a sum of these electronic wave functions times a new function, uh, C, which is only dependent upon the distance. So we're taking all of the start off the electronic functions, function of R, fixed internuclear distance. These new functions are the nuclear wave functions, which contain the remaining R dependence of the total wave function. The total wave function, the mixed function of all of the different uh, nuclear coordinates and electronic coordinates. So I'm going to bring this back to the next page. 
Um, so the born oppenheimer approximation, what it does is it's going to neglect that our terms were missing and our, this isn't really a derivation, this is a statement. Um, neglects coupling between electronic and nuclear wave functions. That, for the most part, works, but it cannot work. It can break down for high energy states near the ionization threshold. If I have an electron and I'm take, putting it into, let's say, some molecular orbital which is very diffuse, they're actually called Rydberg states because they they're might be so far out that the rest of the molecule looks like a single point. It looks like a one electron atom. Those electrons are now so loosely held that they're moving very slowly. And because of that, they might, you, this approximation might break down at that point. But that's kind of a rare situation. So now this term here, C, is going to give us our vibration and rotation. And so for each potential energy surface, excuse me. So what we can, what we're going to do is we're going to construct um, a Hamiltonian. We'll see this, a Schrodinger equation down at the bottom. So let's just start with a statement. Each potential energy surface, E sub I, R, there's a complete set of wave functions and energy levels. What, let's look at this notation that we have here. So um, for each potential energy surface, we're going to take the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. We have wave functions within the Born-Oppenheimer approximation and a energy within the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And what we're now doing is we are solving for these energies. This is just the Schrodinger equation again. So what do I have here? This is a, <clears throat> this is a potential energy. for um, nuclear motion. It is essentially the energy of, from the, it's the electronic energy as a function of coordinates. It is a potential energy surface. So the E sub I is a potential energy surface of, for, from, from the electronic wave function. We have the nuclear wave function And what do I have? I have a kinetic energy operator plus a potential operating on a wave function, giving me an energy back times that wave function back. So these, within the born oppenheimer approximation, we have a number of levels, which are, these are going to be uh, energy, N energy levels. And I believe I changed my I believe that I changed my notation halfway through this. This should be N. So N are the nuclear energy levels within the I's electronic state. So I refers to the electronic state. N is the uh, nuclear energy is the nuclear energy level. And we'll see this is a combination of vibration and rotation. And so let me write this out here. This means Born-Oppenheimer approximation. This is the ith electronic state. And this corresponds to the N then corresponds to uh, energy levels for nuclear motion within the potential energy surface of the ith electronic state. So um, the, this potential energy surface does not depend upon the angles. And when I say angle, I mean this molecule may be rotating in space. 
And the, so long as there's not an electric field or a magnetic field of any kind, then there is no potential for rotation. And so the potential energy surface looks the same no matter what the orientation of the molecule. Because of that, we're going to be able to separate this wave function, this nuclear wave function, into angular and nuclear coordinates. So C is now equal to uh, Y sub J, M sub J, theta and phi, times a, another function, F, <clears throat> which now notice, what do we have here? This is going to be uh, this is going to be the, I'm going to start. This is the ith electronic state. potential energy surface. The nu sub k is going to be the quantum number for vibration k. And then k is an index for what, what vibration we have. which we'll see there are 3n minus 6, or 3n minus 5 for a linear molecule. So now this holds strictly only a limit where there's no centrifugal stretching. So if once my molecule starts rotating, what does happen is, is that the molecule might stretch out a little bit. And then we can introduce, we can handle that. We're just going to need to use perturbation theory to bring that in. And we'll see we have correction terms we'll talk about later. Those come in from perturbation theory although we will not treat those that way. Okay, so uh, here's our function. Again, just going through. I represents the electronic potential energy surface, or the ith electronic state, the various quantum states of n of the C wave function, this, this thing right here, are now represented by j, m sub j, and the 3n minus 6 epsilon k, uh, 3n minus 5 if the molecule is linear. The y, j, and m are rotational wave functions, and they're spherical harmonics with quantum numbers j and m sub j. They're, it's angular momentum quantum numbers. So uh, j, angular momentum quantum number, m sub j, the z component of angular momentum for that state. The f term is I epsilon k, k of R, is a product of the vibrational wave functions for each of the normal modes, k. So that is going to be a product of, now chi, this is a, it's a Morse, for a bond stretch, it probably looks like a Morse potential. It could be a bend, however, or a dihedral angle, in which case it's going to have a different looking potential. But at the bottom of the well, it will all look harmonic. And so we'll use the approximation that these are the uh, normal modes of the molecule. The Q, capital Q, are the symmetry adapted normal coordinates for motion. And we have those vibrational wave functions all the way up to 3n minus 6. So you can see what we're doing here is we're taking a very, very complex problem in multiple dimensions and we're really separating it on out into it's like individual dimensions that we can solve. Now, of this, that's mostly vibration. But what about that, that uh, the angular momentum term? Because that's what we're interested in right now. The vibration, rotational energy, kinetic energy of the molecule is, so the kinetic energy, T, is going to be given by this thing. Here now, that is in Cartesian coordinates. You just equal to minus h bar squared uh, over two mu del squared in Cartesian coordinates, which is just partial. The del is just going to be partial squared partial x squared plus partial squared partial y squared plus partial squared partial z squared. And you say, why don't we use that term instead? Instead of this complicated one, because you see now we've got a fairly complex P 
piece which has another operator in it, which I'm showing down here. How do we do this? We put a wave function behind this. We take the second derivative with respect to phi. We multiply it by one over sine squared theta. Set it aside. We take the wave function. So this is my sum wave function. I take my wave function here, the derivative of that with respect to theta. We multiply that by sine theta. We can take its derivative with respect to theta again, then multiply by one over sine theta, multiply by one over by minus h bar squared. We put it in here, now divide by h bar squared, divide by r squared. Um, we're also going to have psi, take the derivative of that with respect to r, multiply that by r squared, take that whole thing, take the derivative with respect to r, multiply by one over r squared, and then finally multiply by h bar squared over two mu, and that is the application of the kinetic energy uh, operator onto a wave function. All right, now what we can do with this is and make this a lot easier is, is that if r is fixed, then all of the terms in r disappear. In other words, any partial partial r on some function, which is fixed r is equal to zero. So if I'm going to start with the idea that my molecule, my, and in this case we're going to look at a diatomic, and that r is just the distance between the two nuclei, and now this becomes much simpler. All the other terms drop out, and what I end up with is just my rotational Hamiltonian acting on my spherical harmonics, my wave function for rotation, equal to minus h bar <clears throat> squared expectation value of r minus 2, jj plus 1 multiplied by the wave function back again. It's an eigenfunction equation. Now, in the we can simplify this greatly. In the vibrational ground state, r is approximately equal to the bottom of the well, vibrational potential. And so it rotation wave function just becomes equal to a collection of constants, b sub e, times j, j plus 1. That's it. And j goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Uh, m sub j, although it's not included in the energy, it is included in the gen degeneracy. So m sub j has values from minus j to plus j in intervals of 1. So uh, finally, my rotational constant is typically expressed in wave numbers. And if we use a relationship, you know, I always use, just remember, I remember that E is equal to H nu. I remember that E is equal to H C over lambda. And since 1 over lambda is value of wave numbers, nu bar, then we can just rewrite this. And then B is equal to H bar over, uh, yeah, H bar over 4 pi C mu r sub e squared. <clears throat>